Chapter One of Prodigal Daughters. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. Prodigal Daughters by Joseph Hawking. Chapter One The Colonel Returns it was early in the summer that a tall lean bronzed-looking man found his way up the gangway from boulogne pier to the cross-channel steamer even had he been in civilian attire he would not have been taken for anything but a soldier a soldier of the best order there was something in the way he walked something too in the light of his thoughtful grey eyes which suggested not only order and precision but association with danger this man's face seemed to speak of tense movements when the life of thousands depended on rapid far-seeing judgments he might have been from forty to fifty years of age and it was evident that in spite of his quiet demeanour he was much excited he spoke no word but it was easy to see that he was impatient at the boat's delay in starting and when at length it passed into the open channel he kept his eyes fixed towards the english shore as though longing for the first sight of the land of his birth ah there it is the words escaped him involuntarily and as he spoke there was a look in his eyes which spoke of a great longing there was wonder in them too as though the shores of england now dimly visible aroused thoughts too deep for words presently his lips quivered and his eyes became slightly dimmed nearly six years he murmured even alice will be changed while the children will have grown almost beyond recognition if ever a man looked eagerly forward to his return home it was lester trelawney he had been away from home for six years even before the outbreak of the war his regiment having been sent to egypt he had to bid good-bye to his wife and children almost without warning or time for preparation from the time he landed at alexandria his life had been one continual excitement owing to a strange series of happenings he had before he had time to settle down in egypt been ordered to india where he found himself in a centre of unrest and danger for nearly two years he practically lived from hour to hour events of which the british public knew nothing happened thick and fast and as he proved himself not only a brave soldier but a man of more than ordinary intelligence he was entrusted with work which was not only vitally important but terribly exacting at the end of his work in india he was sent to mesopotamia where after a good deal of strenuous work he had been taken prisoner here in a foul-smelling den he had been taken ill and practically gave up all hope of ever seeing his home again a sound constitution and a dogged determination not to be beaten however carried him through not only did he get well but he managed to escape from his jailers added to this he was able to pick up information of such value that when at length he was enabled to rejoin the army he became especially marked out for intelligence work this led to his being sent on various missions which although engrossing beyond words kept him from returning home for months together lester trelawney was away from civilization 
this led on more than one occasion to his wife and family giving him up for dead even when at length the armistice was signed he was still kept in the east through the years he had gained such experience and his work had become so exacting that no one else could be entrusted with it trelawney is that you he turned and saw a man who had just emerged from a cabin why yes it's wickham i am glad to see you not more glad than i am to see you heaven only knows how much good honest sorrow i've wasted over you you've been given up for dead twice of course something of the truth has come out about you if i had had the slightest idea you were aboard i wouldn't have stayed in that stuffy cabin let's see you've not been home since fourteen have you no beastly shame i call it still you've brought it on yourself if you will make yourself indispensable you have to pay the price for it but you are all sorts of a big gun now i can tell you hardly only a colonel but you'll be more than that a brigadier for certain the other shook his head i'm not troubling about that sort of thing he replied my one thought is to see my wife and children of course of course by jove you'll be a bit excited although you look as cool as a cucumber why it's nearly six years since you left yes six years and there was a far-away look in his eyes i saw your wife a few weeks ago did you trelawney looked questioningly at the other yes she looked hardly a day older the change will not be in her it will be in the children how many have you four two boys and two girls the youngest peggy was barely eleven when i left the eldest trevor was just over seventeen when the war broke out and now he's twenty-three by jove you will find a change there we're slowing down we shall be in the harbour in another three minutes we'll go up to london together eh i can't promise replied trelawney i sent word to my wife that i was coming by this boat she may be here to meet me oh yes of course well the best of luck i expect i shall be seeing you often now you are back again a few minutes later the boat had entered the harbour and colonel trelawney was looking eagerly towards the pier as if in expectation of seeing some one he knew presently his eyes lit up with a look of gladness there she is he said aloud and then turned to his man and gave him instructions about his luggage lester trelawney was utterly unconscious of the crowd of onlookers as he passed along the gangway he had seen a face which made him forget not only the past years of peril and excitement but all his surroundings alice my darling it is good of you to come he murmured as he held a little woman in his arms and kissed her many times there don't cry little wife i'm back safe and sound i can't help it she sobbed i'm so so oh thank god you've come she was a small-featured but pretty woman in spite of the fact that she was past forty there was scarcely a line on her face and not a single grey hair among her golden locks she seemed almost pathetically little and fragile as she looked into her husband's face and one could easily imagine that the lonely soldier had had many anxious hours at the thought that this clinging woman was alone with the cares of a family weighing on her but that was all forgotten now the war was over the years of terror had passed and he was home again oh lester i'm so proud so thankful so happy you are sure you are all right sure alice he laughed there i'll try and find an empty carriage i bribed the conductor to reserve one for us and a blush surmounted her cheek as she spoke i thought i thought 
yes i know what you thought interrupted trelawney joyfully alice this hour almost repays one for all the years we've been separated there are thousands of questions i want to ask you and heaps of things you'll have to tell me the children are all right i hope he asked the question in a matter-of-fact way but it was easy to see how much it meant to him yes they are all right of course trevor isn't at home but the girls are both all right you'll hardly know them those photographs i sent you hardly gave you an idea what they are like eleanor is a head taller than i she's twenty-one you know while peg as you always called her has her hair up fancy my little peg with her hair up trelawney sighed as he spoke then she'll be quite grown up yes quite she's a lot older than her age oh i am glad you are home again i don't think i could have gone on much longer without you nothing wrong i hope oh no nothing at all but oh i have wanted you they were alone in the compartment at length and again colonel trelawney took his wife in his arms and held her close to him evidently the years had not cooled his ardour nor had his affection for his wife lessened nevertheless there was a tone in her voice that made him anxious especially when he asked her about the children as he looked at his wife again moreover something struck him which had not troubled him before she seemed to him to lack decision and steadiness of purpose she was a loving gentle little creature but she was weak and lacking in that power of command which had been of such value to him during the last fateful years of his life ah well i hope i am home for good now he replied gently oh my little wife you have not wanted me half as badly as i have wanted you she nestled up closely to him like a tired child nestles to its mother and sighed contentedly i never wanted you so much as during the last two years she said you see the children seem to grow up suddenly and but oh john has been such a comfort to me john yes i know you used to think him dull and a little bit sullen but he isn't at all he's rather quiet still and reserved but he's as steady as old times and so thoughtful do you know i've had to consult him about everything especially since he left school as soon as he knew the state of my finances he wouldn't hear of going to oxford you see trevor's pay hardly covers his expenses boys in the army have to keep up appearances you know then what's john doing i fully intended him to go to oxford perhaps i ought to have told you but the boy wouldn't let me he said it would bother you as i told you trevor being in an expensive regiment had to come to me for help so john insisted on helping me insisted on helping you how the father of his principal chum at rugby is in the motor business and john who as you know always had a passion for engineering went to him and asked him for work he's been there a year now and is doing splendidly mr davenport gives him a salary and is so pleased with him that he has promised him quite a good position in a few months colonel trelawney looked thoughtful he was not a rich man but he had thought that his private income added to the amount he had arranged for her out of his army pay would be ample for all the wants of the family indeed this was one of the things that comforted him when he was far away from civilization and when it seemed doubtful whether he would ever see his family again his house in hampstead was not large but it was his own property and he had never dreamed that his wife would have to face financial difficulties you see everything has become so dear 
went on mrs trelawney prices are simply awful and although school bills have stopped the girls have had to have more expensive dresses while as i told you trevor has had to be helped of course eleanor earned a good deal eleanor cried the colonel in a tone of questioning surprise yes she got a post under government everybody did it during the war you know but that's over now still it has given the girls all sorts of notions trelawney was silent he was an understanding man and although he spoke no word it was easy to see that he read more in his wife's words than she had voiced poor little girl he said at length i'm afraid you've had a difficult time and i have been so wrapped up in my own affairs that i have not realized how you've been placed but never mind i'm home now and together we'll soon have everything straight i'm sure i've tried very hard to do what i thought you would like said mrs trelawney but i never realized how helpless i was until i was left alone end of chapter one Chapter Two of Prodigal Daughters by Joseph Hawking. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kate Fallis. Chapter Two The Old Order Changeth. Although Colonel Trelawney's house was not a large one, especially when compared with those in that part of Hampstead Heath in which it was situated it had a spacious comfortable appearance the garden surrounding it added to its attractiveness and made it appear more homelike indeed when the taxi stopped and trelawney got out and looked around him it seemed a very haven of rest to a homesick man it's just beautiful he sighed contentedly just as i have thought of it during six lonely years but all thoughts of house and garden passed from him in a moment for he heard the sound of voices and the scamper of feet a second later the door was opened and he was met by two girls who rushed towards him why eleanor he cried as he kissed the older and taller of the two i shouldn't have known you and by jove you are a pretty girl too as for little peg why you young puss what have you done with yourself like topsy i've growed replied the girl you have growed you make me feel an old man you were a rackety untidy kid when i left and now you are far taller than your mother still you are dad's baby aren't you not much of a baby about me retorted the girl saucily they were both good-looking girls eleanor the older and taller of the two had almost classical features and a striking appearance generally peggy the younger although not yet eighteen years old had a fine well-developed figure both were attired in the latest fashion each of their dresses was cut very low at the neck while their skirts were so short that they exhibited much more of their lower limbs than their grandmothers would have considered necessary colonel trelawney's quick observant eye took all this in at a glance but he made no remark indeed he was so happily excited that details of dress counted for little but where's john he asked here father said a youth coming forward i only wanted to give the girls the first chance he was a quiet thoughtful-looking young fellow just turned nineteen there was a family resemblance between him and the girls but there was something in his face which suggested a difference of character 
he seemed more reposeful more trustworthy colonel trelawney hesitated a moment and then he put his arm around his shoulder and kissed him god bless you my boy he said fervently john blushed a fiery red while peggy tittered he was a sensitive fellow and like other boys of his age was not given to open manifestation of his feelings your mother has told me about you went on the colonel of course i'm immensely pleased that you've been wanting to help your mother all the same i'm sorry you didn't go on to the varsity john shuffled awkwardly and was silent he had been steadily watching his father ever since he had entered the house as if trying to make up his mind about him but he's been such a comfort to me interposed the mother i don't know what i should have done without him john looked more uncomfortable than ever while peggy laughed aloud and then burst out singing our john's a pattern boy a pattern boy a pattern boy our john's a pattern boy yes a pattern boy do be quiet peg he exclaimed but you are laughed the girl and it's only right father should know it oh well broke in the colonel it's good to see you all even though i can't realize even yet that you are no longer children but i must get used to that in the meanwhile we will have a great time together after i've settled up a few things i'm going to have a complete holiday come you girls kiss your old dad again and then we'll have dinner mother told me she'd arranged to put it off till i came home so you'll be hungry we are assented peggy dinner will be ready in five minutes mrs trelawney informed them then i'll have a wash in the meantime said the colonel oh my little kiddies god only knows how i've longed for this hour he found his way upstairs as he spoke while the two girls exchanged significant glances eleanor had scarcely spoken a word since her father's first greeting but she had never taken her eyes from him she might have been trying to understand what kind of man he was john was also silent but the look in his eyes as he watched his father go upstairs spoke volumes during dinner the gathering was somewhat subdued possibly the fact that the head of the house sat at the table had a restraining influence after all they were children when he went away and for six years his controlling hand had been taken away from them during that time mrs trelawney had been solely responsible for everything and she had on her own confession felt the burden of that responsibility very heavily more than once colonel trelawney looked searchingly from one face to another the experience was as strange to him as to his family to leave four children to be for several years separated from them and then to return home and find them changed almost beyond recognition made him feel almost like a stranger in his own house his wife only had remained the same the years of absence had scarcely changed her at all she was the same loving unselfish creature he had always known her to be but the children puzzled him he did not pass any judgment however he was still under the excitement of his homecoming and he felt supremely happy at the thought that he was sitting at his own table with his family around him as for john the colonel's heart warmed as he looked at him i shall be able to make a pal of him he thought he's a fine lad if only trev were here we should all be home together he said aloud presently i know it can't be helped but i would have given a good deal to have him with us oh trev's all right laughed peggy he's no end of a swell i don't know how many hearts he's broken already 
the colonel made no reply he did not seem quite sure of his ground and his eyes were passing quickly from face to face as if endeavouring to form judgment if he can't get leave i shall go to see him at the first opportunity was all he said before going on to relate some of his experiences during the years he had been away the evening passed quickly away the colonel was blissfully happy at being home again while years had seemed to have rolled from his wife at the thought of having him by her side well what do you think of them she asked when at length they had retired to their room john splendid he replied heartily just splendid he is isn't he of course the girls laugh at him but there isn't a nicer boy living why should the girls laugh at him oh they say he's such a sober sides and and what do you think of the girls eleanor seems very clever but a bit reserved i can't quite make her out yet no she isn't easy to understand of course she's very handsome and very high-spirited and has all sorts of ideas she's got beyond me in fact they both have in what way tell me mrs trelawney hesitated a moment and seemed on the point of answering him but decided to be silent meanwhile the two girls found their way upstairs while john went into the room which in the past years had been called the treadmill it was the room which when they had a governess had been used as a schoolroom well queried peggy when they were alone i see trouble replied eleanor well trouble or no trouble i'm dying for a cig it's the first evening i've spent without smoking for ages give me one haven't got any here i left them down in the treadmill then let's go down and get them i can't sleep without a smoke we'll have to be careful as you can easily see he's of the old-fashioned order and may be shocked well he must be shocked that's all i'm not one to hide my light under a bushel besides everybody smokes now i scarcely know a girl who doesn't have her packet of cigarettes a day still as you say we'll have to be careful he'll not be played with like you i see trouble but let's go down to the treadmill and smoke there the girls went quietly downstairs and found their way into their old schoolroom hello johnny darling exclaimed peggy what are you doing here it's time for children like you to be in bed what are you doing here then retorted john we've come for a smoke replied peggy we haven't any backy upstairs so we came here john looked at them steadily for a few seconds you are afraid of him then he replied afraid not a bit what is there to be afraid of nothing if you play the game was the boy's reply don't be silly cried peggy lighting a cigarette and throwing herself in an armchair there was a silence for a few seconds then eleanor broke out well mother's darling what do you think of him he's splendid replied the boy he's just great all the same we are in for a new dispensation a good thing too he added after a few seconds silence bosh replied peggy it's not bosh retorted john if father had been home these last two years things would have been different and you know it bosh repeated peggy i'm just going on in the same way no you are not as a proof of it why didn't you smoke when he was with us why my dear boy there's nothing in smoking i don't say there is but why didn't you oh well we naturally wanted to see which way the wind blew you see he's at a dangerous age 
she giggled and of course eleanor and i wanted to sum him up first and what do you think of him oh i suppose he's all right but if he thinks he is going to find us a pair of antiques he'll pretty soon find out his mistake he'll have to come to our ways more likely to be the other way i hope so anyhow look here pattern boy are you going to play the game asked eleanor i've nothing to do with it replied john but i'm glad that dad's come home it's time he did come too you've been just doing what you liked with mother and it's done you no good as for dad he's just great i tell you he's the most splendid man i ever saw any one can see at a glance that he's kind and just but i'll stand no nonsense i watched the look in his eye when one of you said something he didn't like he didn't say anything but you'll find out your mistake if you think he's going to allow things to run loose he may be old-fashioned but he's a gentleman through and through and you'll find that he'll be obeyed i'll admit there's a look in his quiet grey eyes which is a bit discomforting eleanor spoke as though she were thinking deeply oh i'm prepared for a hell of a row rejoined peggy flippantly as she crossed her legs and puffed at her cigarette you wouldn't say that in dad's presence john said quietly why what's the harm in it every girl swears now not nice girls retorted the boy thank you and peggy's eyes blazed then we are not nice girls what's the use of getting into a passion was john's reply you know as well as i do that you've picked up with a fast set as a consequence real nice girls are dropping you there's the new hams for example they who cares for the news hams as everybody knows they are just a narrow-minded church-going lot who are tied to their mammy's apron strings what's the use of living if you can't enjoy yourself i believe dad will want us to enjoy ourselves replied john but any one can see with half an eye that he's as keen as a razor and that he won't have you going to such dances as you have gone to neither will he have such bounders as that fellow barnes coming to the house look here johnny if you tell dad anything about jim i'll i'll never speak to you again there'll be no need for me to tell him replied the boy if barnes comes here he'll see for himself but i tell you he'll show him the door in double quick time if jim isn't allowed to come here i shall go to him that's all answered peggy quickly besides why shouldn't he come here i'm going to choose my own friends and if dad thinks he's going to dictate to me he'll find out his mistake i had a good mind to let him come to-night but i thought it might be going a bit too far i expect the mater has told our long-lost father all about him by this time rejoined eleanor no she hasn't laughed the younger girl i put the fear of god into her last night i told her that if she tried to prejudice him against jim or said anything about him i'd run away with him but you don't care anything about him that's all you know anyhow he's good fun and he's one of the best dancers in london in any case if our long-lost father thinks we are going to be like nuns shut up in a nunnery the sooner he knows the truth the better personally i can't imagine what you see in him said eleanor for that matter i can't understand girls who are forever ogling men of course they are all right in their way they take one to the theatre or to supper but as for the love business and marrying it's just sickening i think any girl is a fool who gets married oh you're cold-blooded i try to be sensible anyhow life isn't a very long business 
and the idea of getting married and having babies and that sort of thing is simply nauseous i suppose that's why you turn the cold shoulder to rod ravenscroft rod ravenscroft is all right as a friend and if i wanted to marry i'd as soon have him as anybody but as i've just said love and marriage make no appeal to me still i don't want to judge any one else we must all live our own lives that's what i mean to do cried peggy and that's why i don't mean to let any one interfere between me and jim you'll find that dad will interfere interposed john then he'll be told to mind his own business that's all it is his business how is it his business if i'm fond of jim it's my own affair but the fellow is such a bounder bounder yourself retorted peggy with flashing eyes and a goody goody bounder at that of course he's fond of life but so am i and i'm not going to stand any interference either from you or any one else i told mother so last night john shrugged his shoulders time will tell he remarked quietly i suppose that means that you'll tell retorted peggy well tell i don't care hark what's that cried eleanor at that moment there was the sound of footsteps on the gravel outside and a low tapping at the window pane peggy's face flushed crimson that'll be jim she whispered i told him not to come to-night but 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 surely you are not going out to him said john as he saw his sister preparing to leave the room of course i am was the girl's reply i'll be back in ten minutes end of chapter two chapter three of prodigal daughters by joseph hawking this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by kate fallis chapter three pegs carrying on look here eleanor said john when peggy had gone dad'll have to know about this i suppose he will was the reply but i don't see why he should i say that's cool cool if you like but it's true it isn't true don't you see peg's an ass she's lost her head about this fellow barnes and it should be put a stop to why do you know anything wrong about him he isn't our sort for one thing and for another peg's too young she's only a kid and it's not the thing for her to go out alone to meet him i'm sure dad won't have him coming to the house he's common he has no breeding in short he's a bounder as for a kid like peg going out like that it's a bit too thick oh peg knows how to take care of herself she's a bit too developed on the physical side but she's level-headed and knows her way around she's years older than most girls her age you'll see she'll be back in ten minutes if she isn't i'll go out and kick the fellow off the premises johnny dear you make me tired you talk as though he lived a hundred years ago when girls didn't know how to look after themselves and when it was thought the duty of brothers to interfere with their sisters lives peg's an ass if you like but she's all right besides a girl has the right to live her own life but she's making herself cheap just think of it colonel trelawney's daughter gone out on the sly to meet her young man like any common girl nothing very sly about it laughed eleanor no peg's not that sort what she does she does in the open not that i agree with her and i shall tell her so any girl's a fool to get fond of a fellow and a bigger fool still to let him see it still she seems to be cast in that mould and never seems happy unless she's with him 
i tell you dad won't have it he's not that sort i saw that the moment i looked at him both of you have twisted mother around your fingers but there'll be a change now dad may be quiet but he'll be obeyed he'll find that hampstead is not a barracks and that this is a free country replied eleanor i say eleanor don't you like him don't you think he's just splendid oh yes i like him all right i should think he's a bit antiquated and will need to learn a few things but i fancy i shall be proud of him i do hope he'll be reasonable though what do you mean by that look here johnny i think it is best for us to have a clear understanding about things you seem to think that because a man's your father he has the right to tell you what you shall do and what you shan't do isn't that your idea it may be all right with kids but not at our age peg's only a kid to all intents and purposes peg is over twenty she's what you may call an early development and she knows her own mind it's no use closing our eyes to the fact that the girls of to-day are not going to be treated as our grandmothers were on the other hand dad has been away for several years out of the world in fact he knows nothing of the changes that have taken place he was always a bit old-fashioned and i don't imagine he's altered much of course he's very nice and i think i shall be fond of him but if he thinks we can be treated like one of jane austen's heroines he'll have a rude awakening you seem to be taking a lot for granted eleanor replied john you are talking as though he'd already begun to play the spartan he hasn't said a word and i'm sure he's the grandest man alive oh you are hero worshipping you've got all sorts of highfalutin thoughts about him and look upon him as a little tin god i've been watching him all the evening and i've fairly well summed him up well and what are your conclusions i think there'll be trouble but why because he's a type of the old-fashioned gentleman of the past ages he'll expect us to be amenable to authority and to give an account of our doings and we've got beyond that mother's always been telling us about her young days and what dad would say and do when he came home and that's made peg and me talk about it are you going to support us or are you going to play the sneak look here eleanor dad ought to know how peg's been carrying on she's been doing no wrong i don't say she has but dad must know about this barnes affair besides i tell you straight he won't stand these promiscuous dances and this going out to supper after theatres with fellows that he doesn't know he'll have to stand it what do you mean eleanor just that however we'll hope for the best if he'll be reasonable perhaps we'll be able to rub along anyhow we'll give him a trial meanwhile peggy had rushed into the garden and looked eagerly around jim she whispered is that you yes peg i've come in spite of orders he said as he took the girl in his arms and kissed her ardently but you must clear out in double-quick time dear i shouldn't have come out only i was afraid somebody might hear you he's come then of course he's come what's he like oh a great swell i suppose just the aristocratic pucka officer but he's not a bit like mother what do you mean by that oh i can do what i like with her i can frighten her into almost anything but he's not like her he doesn't say much but there's a look in his eye that makes one hesitate once or twice to-night he almost made me afraid i say peg he did of course i would not own it to the pattern boy or even to eleanor but i fancy there'll be trouble never mind peg darling you have me to stand by you peg was silent what's the matter kid 
i've nothing to tell but i don't think you'd better come for a day or two till i see how things are going you see he's only just come home and i don't quite know how things are going but tell me what he's like oh he's just the aristocratic officer of the old sort he hasn't said much yet but i can see he has silly old-fashioned ideas especially about girls he believes in being very polite and courteous to them in the old-fashioned way but i believe he'd go into fits if he thought i was out here with you now he's just that sort he made me think of rip van winkle to-night all the same i can see that there'll be trouble before we're through the young fellow was silent for a few seconds. "'Perhaps we'd better go slowly for a few days,' he said at length. "'But there, he may not be as bad as you think.' "'Oh, John's made a hero of him already, but he's always been the perfect pattern. I believe he'll tell Dad that I've been out here with you now.' "'Does he know?' "'Yes.' he was in the treadmill with eleanor and me when you came and he says dad ought to know but you'll stand by me old girl won't you you won't let any one come between us i'm not going to be dictated to by any one that'll have to be understood right away what about the dance on saturday he spoke rather doubtfully oh we shall both come to that i wouldn't miss it for anything will you tell him i shall see about that anyhow i shall come if needs be i shall take french leave but i must go in now well be careful peg give me another kiss kid and play your game carefully while peggy trelawney found her way back to the house james barnes wended his way to his home he was rather a handsome young fellow of the flashy sort he had been in the army during the war and by some means or another had obtained a commission he was very proud of this fact and had often read the wording of the commission with great satisfaction belonging to a rather humble station in life he prided himself on the fact that an officer in the army was considered a gentleman and he was very punctilious about his men saluting him and calling him sir it was true he had been greatly chagrined that several officers treated him with scant courtesy and that he was never admitted into certain circles which it was his ambition to enter but he assured his people when he was home on leave that he was as good as the best of them and spoke quite patronizingly of his colonel as a bit old-fashioned but quite a good soldier don't you know before entering the army he had been a clerk in an auctioneer's and real estate agent's office and on being demobilized had been taken back on his old job being a pushing fellow and eager to get on his employers had sometimes entrusted him to deal with some of their less important clients this had led him to describe himself as the representative of messrs feather and byworth real estate agents nevertheless he felt his demobilization keenly he was no longer an officer and a gentleman although he tried to assure himself that he was the latter hang it all he often said to himself i'm more than an ordinary clerk and to be a real estate agent is to have a gentleman's job still he felt sure he was getting on he had taken dancing lessons during the war time and became quite an adept in this art indeed on one occasion he got an invitation to a dance which was given at a house of some importance it was at this house he met eleanor and peggy trelawney and unfortunately caught peggy's fancy after that they met frequently and peggy had insisted that he should be admitted into the house as a friend barnes was greatly delighted at his conquest and frequently spoke of his acquaintance with the trelawney family 
colonel trelawney belongs to one of the oldest families in england he boasted and will soon be a general i'm well in with them all as for the girl she's fairly gone on me still he was not quite happy about the matter he had sense enough to feel his lack of breeding and to realize that not only john but john's friends did not regard him favorably especially was he perturbed when he heard that colonel trelawney was coming home for he counted a great deal on his intimacy with peggy he had great ambitions to be what he called a gentleman and he felt sure that if he could marry into the trelawney family his future would be assured when he reached his home which was in a section of camden town he found that his two sisters who worked in a large drapery establishment in oxford street had just returned from the theatre and were accompanied by two young fellows whom they called their best boys hello jim cried one where have you been oh just paying a visit to a friend been taking out that little bit of fluff that you are so fond of i say riddler i'll trouble you not to talk like that oh all right retorted riddler good-humouredly but i don't see why you should make so much fuss about it the trelawneys are not quite your sort said jim loftily she'll have to be if you marry her was the reply but there i hear her father is coming home so most likely he'll put the kibosh on your little plans i don't see why we are not as good as they are after all broke in edith barnes jim's eldest sister they can't be very wealthy for while one of the sons is in the army the other is just a mechanic at a motor place in oxford street there's not much to choose between being a motor mechanic and a clerk to a house agent of course i know he was at rugby and all that but i consider myself quite as good as peggy trelawney or eleanor either for that matter where's mother asked jim as if anxious to change the subject in bed hours since where all good mothers ought to be laughed jim's other sister but it's getting late and you boys had better be off i'll see my little dicky to the door i suppose you'll be at the dance on saturday jim remarked riddler it'll be the best of the season yes going to take your best girl i don't know what business it is of yours i'll bet you anything you don't why because her father'll be home and he'll put a stop to your little capers we shall see replied jim with seeming confidence nevertheless he went to bed with many doubts in his mind he recalled what peggy had said about her father and although he had made light of riddler's remarks concerning the change the colonel's homecoming would cause he had many misgivings of course i would rather do the thing in a grand way he reflected next morning it would do me no end of good if i could be married at the church with peg's father giving the bride away but i'm not going to stand any nonsense neither will peg end of chapter three chapter four of prodigal daughters by joseph hawking this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by kate fallis chapter four the disillusionment during the next few days colonel trelawney was occupied with affairs at the war office and elsewhere he had many people to see and reports to make to people in high places as a consequence he was away from home all the day and did not return home till dinner-time even on the saturday when he had hoped to take his family to some place of amusement he had been detained at whitehall discussing questions of policy in relation to the eastern races with whom he had been for years associated 
he was greatly disappointed at this for he had eagerly looked forward to a delightful evening at the opera at five o'clock he was on the point of ringing up his wife in order to ask her to bring the children to town so that they might all go together but as fortune or misfortune would have it a message came from an old friend asking him whether he might call at his house that night at nine o'clock as he wished to see him on a matter of importance never mind thought the colonel i shall be freer next week and then we'll make up for lost time it was nearly eight o'clock when he reached home and feeling rather depressed somehow his homecoming had not brought him the happiness he had hoped it is true his wife was just the same loving little soul he had always known her to be but he could not understand his children especially was this true of the girls in spite of all he could say or do a barrier existed between them and while he had as yet said nothing to them about it he was anything but pleased at their evident manner of thinking or of their modes of speech moreover they had not seemed at ease in his presence immediately after dinner they had gone away by themselves as though they wanted to be alone i might be an ogre he said to himself they seem to be utterly uneasy and unnatural when they are with me as though they were afraid i should find out something about them of course john's a fine boy and i can see our becoming great friends but even he doesn't speak as freely to me as i would like to have him however after graythorpe has gone to-night we'll have a clear understanding about everything when he entered the dining-room however he found only his wife there where are the children alice he asked john had to go to the davenports mr davenport wanted to see him about something at the works he said he would be back about ten and the girls where are they they're gone out his wife replied evidently but where mrs trelawney looked uncomfortable i don't know was her hesitating reply don't know that's rather strange isn't it what time will they be home lester i really don't know he was about to question her further but at that moment a servant came into the room and further conversation of this sort was impossible when they were alone again however the colonel who had been silent throughout dinner spoke alice he said you are keeping something from me what is it is there something wrong with the girls no i really don't know nothing more than usual you say you don't know where they are no i don't i believe they are gone to a dance but they would not tell me where would not tell you where i don't understand mrs trelawney burst out sobbing oh my dear she said i'm very unhappy i've wanted to tell you ever since you came home but somehow i couldn't things are so different from what they were when i was a girl the war has changed everything colonel trelawney looked at his wife steadily for a few seconds he understood her perfectly he realized that in spite of all her splendid qualities she was utterly lacking in strength and in the power to command he had not been slow to see that the girls paid her little attention but his mind had been so filled with other things that he had not been able to give much attention to home affairs oh my husband she went on i'm so glad so thankful that you are home so thankful you see they are beyond me when i try to be firm they threaten me threaten you 
i don't understand threaten that they'll leave home threaten all sorts of things but tell me little wife this is serious oh lester i've tried to do my best but what could i do take eleanor for example she was always a reserved independent kind of girl and resented any sort of correction and during the war everything came to a head she got work in a government office where she had very good pay everybody did it and of course i couldn't refuse it it was patriotic she is very clever too and learned stenography and typewriting and all that sort of thing well she got friendly with all sorts of people she brought home some of them nearly all girls of a class of whom i knew nothing fast liquor-drinking women they were who held all sorts of strange notions they swore and discussed things which to me were shocking but eleanor only laughed when i protested and told me that if she couldn't bring them home she should join one of their clubs in town so so you see how i was placed don't you as for peggy she went to a munition factory and and oh my dear i don't know but she seems to like the company of people that i would never think of associating with the colonel listened quietly but made no remarks for several seconds perhaps he was not so much surprised as his wife thought he would be you say eleanor discussed things which you thought shocking he said at length what things oh free love and that sort of thing one of them actually declared to me that while she hated the thought of marriage as an utterly unnatural and degrading thing she claimed the right to have children in order to be true to the maternal instinct that nature had implanted in every woman and of course eleanor listened to this stuff did she seem to agree i don't know i suppose she did for when i told her i would not have that kind of woman in the house she told me about some sort of club of which they were members and which she proposed to join again the colonel reflected a few seconds before speaking and peggy he said at length surely that child did not listen to this stuff oh yes she did and in a way she is the more difficult of the two to deal with she's passionate and wilful and and i don't like talking about it but she never seems happy unless she's with men and she's picked up some fellow named barnes whom i utterly disapprove of picked up some fellow peggy that child oh i knew you would be angry but they were too much for me besides they threatened to leave home and i thought it better for her to bring him here than for her to go with him to places that i knew nothing of and they have gone off to-night gone to some place of which you know nothing oh don't mistake me up to now i don't believe they've come to any real harm in fact i'm sure they haven't but they are beyond me and you've no idea where they've gone to-night no but i'm sure it's to a dance of some sort a dance you mean at some friend's house no i don't it's a subscription dance but who's responsible for it is it on behalf of some charity i don't know then they have no chaperone no they laugh at the idea of such a thing at first i protested at the idea of their going without me but they wouldn't hear of my going with them and what time have they been getting home very late two and three in the morning of course i waited up for them but they insisted that i shouldn't continue to do so they told me that if i did 
they would go to the houses of some of their friends and you what did you do then oh my dear don't be angry with me i didn't know what to do and when they insisted on having latch-keys i thought it best to let them have them what could i do i was here all alone and i didn't like to tell any one about my trouble how could i i tried to comfort myself with the thought that you would come home but oh it was terrible when those awful reports came home about your being missing and and oh my darling thank god you are here i've kept it from you as long as i could but i felt i must tell you no matter what the children might say or do why did they tell you that i must know nothing i think peggy's afraid of you although she says she isn't she threatened me that if i told you about that fellow barnes until she said i might she'd run away and marry him still the colonel kept control over himself what kind of fellow is he he asked at length oh he's rather good-looking after a fashion tall and big and that kind of thing but utterly common he was in the army and had a commission but from what i can learn he is now a clerk or something of that sort and is she supposed to be engaged to him yes no i don't know you see at first i protested against peggy having anything to say to him then when she threatened all sorts of wild things i thought it best to wait until you came home oh if you had only been able to come home six months ago as you thought you would at first it might have been stopped and yet i don't know everything and everybody is upset john did his best and as i told you he's been such a comfort to me but of course he's not like you still i don't know what i should have done without him he doesn't say much but i know he's had a restraining influence especially upon peggy let me understand said the colonel after a few minutes silence from what i can gather they have refused to allow you to control them at all and they've pretty much gone their own way eleanor has got mixed up with a lot of free-thinking women from whom she has imbibed all sorts of ideas and has insisted on entire freedom from you yes i'm afraid she has as for peggy it seems that she's a little bit common i don't like to think so and yet i'm afraid she is you see the war has upset everything all the old-fashioned ideas i was brought up to believe in have been given the go-by at that moment the colonel's visitor arrived and so the conversation ceased but trelawney was sorely disturbed he paid but little attention to what was said and heaved a sigh of relief when he had gone after that he found his way into a little room which had always gone by the name of the den and tried to think out what his wife had said to him at ten o'clock john came home and the colonel eagerly took this opportunity of becoming better acquainted with his son come and have a game of billiards he said i haven't played for years so i expect you'll soon be able to knock spots off me but i'll do my best all right sir replied john following his father into the billiard room the table has been neglected but it isn't in bad condition will you break the colonel selected a cue and did as his son suggested at first john had it all his own way the boy had a good eye and a natural aptitude for the cue so he had made fifty before the colonel had got into double figures my word my boy laughed the father but you are giving me a licking have you spent much time at this only in the holidays sir trev is a good deal better than i 
is he though i can see i must look to my laurels ah but you've left me a set-up now evidently his form had come back for going to the table he made a thirty break and then gave his son a double balk a little later the game was concluded john having won by a single point have another sir presently but let's have a chat first he lit his pipe as he spoke while john looked at him shyly my boy he said i hope we shall be great pals i hope so sir said john blushing and i want you to remember always went on the colonel that although i am a good deal older than you i am not such an old fogey after all my word no replied john i never thought you were that's good what i meant to say was that it doesn't seem so long since i was a youngster myself and i know what a young fellow feels and thinks you'll not forget that if ever you get into any sort of difficulty no sir never be afraid to tell me anything my son you'll find that i understand john was silent but he looked affectionately at his father i think it is easier for me to get on with boys than with girls went on the colonel i expect i understand them better but girls have never been in my way perhaps that is why i seem in closer touch with you than with eleanor and peg john puffed at his cigarette and glanced uneasily around the room john my boy do you know where your sisters are to-night yes sir do you care to tell me where they are i'd rather not if you don't mind sir that's all right my boy but don't always call me sir call me dad sometimes will you gladly sir i mean dad you see my boy i'm afraid eleanor and peggy have not had quite a fair chance i've been away for six years and your mother has had a lot to think about yes sir that's it i yes john what is it said the colonel when john hesitated well sir dad it isn't because i don't want that i don't tell you where the girls are gone only i i want to play the game i quite see your point replied the colonel just as when you were at school you wouldn't tell a master that a boy was breaking the rules yes that's it said john eagerly but you'd want to be fair to the school too went on the colonel you'd want the boy to own up and do the straight thing yes and that's why i made them promise to he broke off suddenly he felt he was perhaps saying too much the colonel did not pursue the conversation further he was an understanding man and was all the better pleased with his son for his reticence let's have another game my boy he said genially and by that time it'll be bedtime when john had gone to bed the colonel had a few minutes conversation with his wife after which he again retired to his den where he seemed in deep thought i don't think there's very much wrong yet he reflected but i fancy i've a difficult job on hand poor little alice i'm sorry for her he sat for a long time thinking occasionally looking at his watch he had carefully drawn the curtains and as the one light was shaded the room from the outside appeared to be in darkness twelve o'clock struck then one then two and still the girls did not come more than once the colonel appeared impatient and almost angry and then a look of affectionate yearning came into his eyes yes he murmured more than once i must get to the bottom of this it's 
bad bad very bad when the hands of the clock were nearing three he heard footsteps outside followed by the sound of voices also there was laughter mayn't we come in this was in a man's voice no not for worlds still more whispering and then more laughter presently the colonel heard the sound of a latch-key inserted in the door followed by more whispering voices evidently our long-lost father is in bed he heard peggy say it would seem so the mater has evidently told him nothing but he must know we've been out all night and i'm looking forward to a hell of a row it may be that he's decided to be sensible and not take any notice of it he heard this as they passed the door of the room evidently it was not their purpose to go straight to bed for they went through the hall as if with the intention of finding their way into the treadmill for a few seconds he stood still as if thinking what was the best thing to do colonel trelawney was greatly perturbed he was more than perturbed he was distressed and angry in spite of what his wife had told him he could not help being shocked at what he had heard peggy say he was a man of the world and quite accustomed to lurid language in the army but he had idealized women and never dreamt that his girls would use terms such as peggy had used after waiting a few seconds he found his way to the treadmill and quietly entered End of chapter 4。Chapter 5 of Prodigal Daughters by Joseph Hawking。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Recording by Kate Follis。Chapter 5 – The Storm Breaks。Both girls started as they saw him each of them sat in an armchair their legs crossed smoking eleanor was the more restrained of the two although the entrance of her father was unexpected and startling she kept her seat and went on smoking peggy however started to her feet her eyes flashing and her lips quivering as though she were preparing herself for a storm excuse me for intruding said the colonel quietly but i thought i would just let you know that i am not asleep both of them were speechless there was something in the quiet tones of his voice something too in his very presence that made them afraid i did not get home till eight o'clock he went on and was naturally surprised not to find you here i was still more surprised to know that your mother did not know where you were gone she did not know because we didn't think it best to tell her replied peggy evidently ready for battle i see remarked the colonel quietly may i ask why because we thought she might tell you was there any objection to that there might be was peggy's curt reply i see you thought i might forbid your going there was a touch of anger in his voice which he could not repress peggy was quick to note this and it gave her the courage to say what she and eleanor had spoken about many times it would have made no difference if you had indeed is that so he replied quietly anyhow it gives one an idea how we stand he was on the point of saying more when he looked at the child's angry defiant eyes in spite of everything she was a pretty attractive girl 
it was true she was rather overdeveloped for one of her years but still only a child to him almost unconsciously his mind fled back over the years and he thought of her as she was when he had left england his memory called up a laughing-eyed untidily dressed wilful but loving little maid who found it difficult to enunciate her r's he remembered her as generous-hearted too difficult to deal with certainly but a tender-hearted little thing all the same he crushed back the words he was going to utter he felt they would do no good and would probably do harm perhaps neither of them had had a fair chance he had been away several years and they looked upon him as a stranger he had been out of the world during those years away from all the influences which had changed the thought and life of the country he must make allowances he must try to understand on the other hand however colonel trelawney was a soldier and a disciplinarian he had a pride of birth too and shrunk from everything that was out of accord with the traditions of his name all the trelawney women were far removed from the loud vulgar type of creature whom at heart he despised and he could not stand supinely by while they besmirched his name children he said quietly you and i will have to understand one another naturally on coming back after so many years i find things changed but we trelawneys have always been very proud of our women we have idealized them somewhat however i need not speak about that now i was much surprised to learn that this is not the first time you have gone out alone and have returned in the early hours of the morning without getting your mother's consent also you've been out without a proper chaperone but we'll not discuss it to-night i'm too distressed to speak as calmly as i ought while you are not in the frame of mind to receive what i shall have to say in the right spirit all the same we shall have to come to an understanding for i can assure you that this kind of thing must come to an end to-morrow we will discuss everything fully meanwhile it is best that you should know that i am trying to look at things from your point of view and that although your old dad has been away so long he loves you both very dearly good night or rather good morning you'll want to go to bed he held the door open and waited for them to pass through he did not offer to kiss them he did not think it best he saw the hot rebellious flash in peggy's eyes and noted the supercilious and slightly bored attitude which eleanor had assumed when they had gone the colonel went back to his den and sat for a long time in deep thought he had never dreamt of such a position and did not know what to do did you speak to them asked his wife when at length he went to his room he shook his head nothing of importance he replied i did not think it wise i only told them we would have to come to an understanding later meanwhile eleanor and peggy had gone to their rooms you see we're in for it said peggy yes of course i saw it would come i summed him up the night he came home i must confess though that he kept very calm i was downright frightened when he came into the room i thought there'd be hell to pay i expect there will before long i don't know i thought he took it very well that's because you don't understand him for my own part i should have been easier in my mind if he had blustered and threatened but he's not that sort he's one of those quiet iron-willed men who are always hardest to deal with 
oh your pranks are over my child what do you mean you'll be as gentle as a cooing dove after he's been home a few weeks will i cried the child defiantly you'll see if he tries to come the stern parent over me i tell you i'll run away i'll marry jim and make a fool of yourself i don't care if i do eleanor shrugged her shoulders of course you'll do as you like but i can see we're in for a storm the next morning the colonel knocked at eleanor's door it's ten o'clock he said pleasantly you'll be late for church if you aren't quick the girl did not speak did you hear me said the colonel in a louder voice yes i heard you that's right you'll be down in a few minutes then no i'm tired i don't propose getting up yet i say i am disappointed said the colonel i had looked forward to your going to church with me on my first sunday home no thank you replied eleanor i don't propose going the colonel hesitated and seemed on the point of saying something more but evidently decided to be silent then he made a movement as if to go to peggy's room but again stopped there was a dangerous flash in his eyes as he went downstairs but he said nothing to his wife going to church john he asked as the clock neared eleven if you wish dad replied the boy when the colonel and john returned an hour and a half later the former was very quiet the whole family gathered in the dining-room for lunch and the colonel talked pleasantly on commonplace topics it might seem as though he had forgotten the previous night's conversation the two girls however were watchful and excited they felt that the atmosphere was tense while mrs trelawney looked nervously from face to face as if constantly expecting an outbreak when lunch came to an end the girls were preparing to leave the room but were suddenly arrested by their father's voice will you all come into the treadmill he said quietly i want a little talk with you i hope it won't take long remarked peggy i have an engagement at three o'clock i'm not quite sure how long our conversation will take replied the colonel it may be best for you to contemplate breaking your engagement whatever it may be although peggy sadly wanted to say something in defiance there was a ring in her father's voice which restrained her she instantly felt a force to which she was unaccustomed she no longer had her mother to deal with but a personality of a different order the colonel did not speak for a few seconds after following them into the room he quietly lit his pipe and after lighting it sat back in his armchair girls he said have you given up going to church there was no reply he repeated the question yes replied eleanor at least i have are you looking for your cigarettes peg have one of mine and she threw her a case are they the cause of it asked the colonel motioning to the cigarettes you never saw your mother use those things because i have no use for religion replied eleanor coolly ignoring his reference to their smoking ah is that so then may i ask why really father i didn't expect to be asked to pass a theological examination i have no use for religion because i can't see what use it is to me i believe there are a few people even yet who find use for it but that is their affair but you have none none that is as religion is ordinarily understood i don't quite follow you i'm sorry the religion i was brought up to believe in doesn't appeal to me 
it doesn't seem to hold water i can't see the good of going to church one is simply bored of course i imagine most people have a religion of some sort but again that is their own affair it's purely a personal matter may i ask whether you've given up the ethics of the christian religion asked the colonel really father i've never considered the matter the world's ideas have grown during the last two thousand years and i imagine if one needs a religion one will have to think the matter out on his own lines that's very interesting then from what you say i suppose you do not regard the christian religion as having any authority over you i don't see why it should have eleanor my dear for shame how can you say such things cried mrs trelawney helplessly although the girl was very pale and her lips trembled somewhat she retained remarkable control over herself she extracted a cigarette from the case which peggy had handed back to her and lit it with fairly steady fingers why for shame mother she asked i suppose father doesn't want me to tell him any lies he has asked me questions and i have tried to answer him to the best of my ability then the commandments are according to your point of view obsolete i suppose asked the colonel taking no notice of his wife's interruption perhaps yes perhaps no what particular commandment do you refer to honour thy father and thy mother was the colonel's reply don't you believe in that not in the sense in which you regard it it may be that one's father and mother do not deserve honouring there is another biblical precept went on the colonel children obey your parents don't you believe in that not necessarily it may be all right for kiddies but when one has grown up one must use one's own judgment i see and the colonel's voice became hard as he spoke then we'll leave the abstract aspect of the question and come to the personal do you regard it as your duty to obey me eleanor thought a few seconds before replying up to now she felt that she was going through her catechism very well she saw too by the triumphant flash in peggy's eyes that her sister thought she had carried her points triumphantly but now she felt on less sure ground try as she might against it there was something in her father's presence that awed her not so much because he was a strong clear-headed man but because he was her father had another man made any assumption of authority she would have strongly resented it but she felt that for some inexplicable reason her father was different still she would stand by her guns as she had told her sister more than once she felt that the tug of war was coming and she thought she was ready for it not if your commands opposed my judgment and hindered my freedom was her answer i see replied the colonel and i presume peggy also has the same views yes only a bit stronger replied peggy and the tones of her voice bordered on the insolent the colonel gave a quick glance around the room and saw his wife's anxious almost horror-stricken look noted too the eager interest in john's face he felt that an important hour had come in the history of his family End of chapter 5chapter six of prodigal daughters by joseph hawking this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by kate fallis 
chapter six the right to live their lives i need scarcely say the colonel spoke very quietly that this kind of thing has come upon me as a kind of shock i have been away for several years and have been ignorant of what has been going on more than once i doubted if ever i should come home but let that pass i have come home and find things different from what i expected i looked forward to finding my girls loving devoted children who would delight in taking me into their confidence i thought we should be great friends and a happy family instead i find a mutinous spirit i find that things have been going on which i utterly disapprove of at first i thought it was a kind of youthful revolt which could easily be quieted i never dreamed that children of mine would studiously and deliberately act in a way which meant setting at naught the desires and wishes of their parents but there it is i find the loving friendships i had looked forward to made impossible not if you mean to be reasonable please remember that we are no longer babies in arms without wills of our own neither are we anything like jane austen's heroines peggy spoke defiantly like one who was ready for battle she was not only passionate and self-willed by nature but like most children of her age she resented being regarded as a child by some strange freak of nature girls of nineteen want to add to their age when they reach thirty it is all the other way she and eleanor had talked many times about what they meant to do if their father tried to curtail their liberty and now they as well as he felt that the hour had come when they must assert their rights of course i have not called you in here without reason went on the colonel no one can tell the pain it gives me to do so but as i said last night we must come to an understanding frankly i cannot and will not have a repetition of last night's experience you mean that you want to shut us up like nuns in a nunnery no i don't mean anything of the sort i remember that you are young and that it is your right to enjoy yourself i came home with the determination to give you all the enjoyment it was in my power to give i wanted you to meet with young people of your own age of course i expected you to be good god-fearing christian girls and i hoped you would feel you had your duties in life but i wanted you to take part in all good healthy pleasures eleanor was silent but peggy forced a laugh really father you remind one of rip van winkle she said the colonel felt his anger rising but he suppressed it possibly that may be the case he replied still i am trying to look at the situation fairly i came home after several years absence and find my two daughters defying their mother's authority i find them refusing to tell her where they are going why should we tell her snapped peggy i find too as was exemplified last night that they go to indiscriminate dances without a chaperone and return between two and three in the morning accompanied by men of whom i know nothing well we are no longer children asserted peggy i will say nothing of the good taste of this went on the colonel to put it on no higher platform neither will i for the moment discuss the effect it is likely to have on your future but one would have thought that you would have had some thought for the feelings of your father and mother i hoped that you would remember that your mother has suffered much and sacrificed much for your sakes and that you would have respected her wishes 
the argument doesn't seem to carry conviction interposed eleanor it isn't a matter of argument replied the colonel it is a matter of decent feeling i am afraid i don't see it we weren't consulted whether we would be born or not it wasn't for our pleasure that we were brought into the world then as i understand it you utterly refuse to recognize your mother's authority or mine really father i don't want to shock your feelings but honestly i do not see why it is my duty to obey my parents i do not see by what right they expect obedience from me i did not ask to be born i am here in the world without my own consent and seeing i am here i do not see why i should not live my own life in my own way then i'll put it this way replied the colonel do you think your parents have any duty towards you yes i think they have seeing they have brought me into the world it is their duty to do their best for me but for the life of me i can't see what duty i owe to them just so replied the colonel and it is because i feel i have a duty towards you that i am not going to allow you to go on in the way you have been going i suppose that means that you are going to restrict our liberty if you mean to put it that way yes you mean to dictate to us to tell us what time we may go out and what time we may come in don't try to misinterpret my words in all the established natural healthy things of life i should not think within ordinary limitations of interfering with you but i have my duties as a parent whether or not you have yours as children one of those duties is to see that my children do not ruin their lives for that reason i will not have them making undesirable acquaintances or going to amusements of which i don't approve and please children remember that i am not thinking only of myself in this i am thinking of you please remember too that i love you wouldn't it be well to drop the sentimental side of the question replied eleanor coolly we have to take things as they are now father listen to reason you have been away a good many years during which time the thoughts of the world have changed and we have ceased to be children we have learnt to think for ourselves to live our own lives and choose our own companions you come back to us a stranger and you expect us to get sentimental about you and to allow you to dictate our way of life is that the position and if it is well then i tell you plainly i don't propose to submit may i ask what you propose to do i propose to go my own way to live my own life so do i interposed peggy defiantly the colonel was silent for a few seconds the case was more difficult than he imagined he found it easy to command a number of soldiers who were amenable to discipline but he was for a moment at a loss how to treat his own children oh my dear children pleaded mrs trelawney don't you see how foolish you are don't you realize that your father is older and wiser than you it comes to this said the colonel i find open rebellion in my house i find that you my children declare war against me i am more grieved than i can say but i am not a martinet i want to do what is right but i must have obedience what is that but being a martinet you want to treat us as though we had no life or convictions of our own no replied the colonel i don't but i must be master in my own house and i will not have my children 
going to places of which i don't approve i will not have my daughters going out to parties without a proper chaperone i will not have them coming home at any time they choose and i will not have them picking up with common fellows as though they had no self-respect i suppose mother's been telling you lies about jim cried peggy passionately that's mean and underhanded jim's as good as we are i've said no word about any one interposed the colonel but i can see what you mean and i'm not going to be dictated to and if i like to go out with jim i shall the colonel still kept his temper do i understand that you are engaged to jim whoever he may be asked the colonel and there was a touch of sarcasm in his voice and if i am what then well for one thing you are not of age and therefore i shall have something to do with it and for another it is my duty to my child to see that any man she may care for is worthy of her and now i think enough has been said for the present of course you've done what we expected replied eleanor you've taken your own line of action and you leave us no alternative but to take ours very well if you will have it so it must be so i have tried to keep from saying anything harsh and i'm deeply grieved that you've met me in this spirit although she did not realize it mrs trelawney had made her husband's work difficult almost on every occasion when the girls had been headstrong and rebellious she had threatened them with what their father would do when he came home she had painted him as a relentless disciplinarian one who would put down disobedience with a strong hand their antagonism had been aroused before the colonel arrived and eleanor and peggy had often discussed the question as to what they would do if their father sought to interfere with them in spite of themselves however the colonel's homecoming had influenced them instead of being a kind of ogre they found him kind and loving it was true he was old-fashioned in his views but he was anything but the overbearing military autocrat which they had conjured up there was a quiet strength too in his every word and movement which they could not understand but which they could not help feeling still and this was especially true of eleanor they determined not to yield an inch from the position they had taken up may i ask eleanor spoke frigidly whether i have to obtain your consent before going out for a walk this afternoon i think i should like a little exercise yes and i should like to know whether you object to our bringing in our friends peggy burst out before the colonel had a chance of replying to eleanor certainly you may bring in your friends replied the colonel i always brought home my friends as a boy and my father always encouraged me to do so does that mean that i can bring jim home the colonel hesitated a few seconds yes he replied i shall be glad if you will i think it will be well for me to see him john gave his father a quick glance i say dad he cried protestingly yes my boy what is it you told me i might have george davenport into supper to-night certainly i did what then only that that john stammered painfully yes what is it persisted the colonel nothing replied john perhaps i'll get george to come another time but why another time to-night is quite convenient and i want you to have your friend in i want to meet him you are pals at rugby and i want you to keep up your school friendships 
all right sir replied john but it was easy to see that he was angry of course i am assuming that none of my children will have friends who are undesirable went on the colonel quietly as a youngster i would never think of bringing home a fellow that i thought my father would not approve of now then be off as soon as you like it's a splendid afternoon and the air on the heath is glorious to-day the battle had ended in a kind of compromise indeed it was not a battle at all rather it was only a kind of preliminary skirmish which had settled nothing peggy however felt differently the fact that her father had consented to her bringing barnes to the house gave her a sense of victory mrs trelawney had told her again and again that the colonel would never dream of allowing such a thing and now after what she called her first pitched battle her father had capitulated without conditions made her feel confident of the future it's all right eleanor she cried we've won all along the line don't be silly kid i'm not silly why he gave way in everything he gave way in nothing nothing why the fact that i'm bringing jim home is proof that he has nothing of the sort he's allowing you to bring him here that he may see what kind of fellow he is my dear girl don't you see it's the thin end of the wedge he's afraid we shall do something desperate if we don't have our way all we've got to do is to be firm i mean to be anyhow was eleanor's reply on the whole i'm glad we've had this breeze it's cleared the air and it's given us some idea as to where we are at any rate we've let him see that we mean to stick to our guns that's the glory of it i promised to meet jim at four o'clock what are you going to do i say peg you are silly about that fellow you'll be tired of him in a few weeks i shan't be anything of the sort i know he's not your kind but i mean to marry him marry him you are a silly idiot well i do and my lordly father will soon have to know it but my dear girl he can't keep you yes he can he's making a good deal of money now and he'll be making a good deal more soon but but my dear girl he's not father's sort you know he's fifty times finer looking than any of your men friends as for our pattern boy he just looks shabby and commonplace beside him the truth was peggy since her father's return and fearing what he might say and do had become more and more enamoured with barnes she dreaded the thought of losing him and wondered if the colonel would take some steps to separate them at the dance on the previous evening when barnes was somewhat heated with his libations he had told peggy that he was not going to stand any nonsense and had hinted to her that plenty of girls with lots of money could be his for the asking poor child utterly inexperienced and lacking in judgment as she was she looked on him as a kind of apollo she did not see how common he was or realize in spite of what her brother had told her that he would be regarded as a rank outsider perhaps if she had it would have made no difference barnes's love-making had carried her off her feet and owing to the fact that she had been working among curious people at the munition factory her sense of values had been utterly distorted where are you going asked peggy as she saw her sister preparing to go out i'm going to the amazon club for tea replied eleanor and since our long-lost and autocratic papa has given his lordly consent for us to bring our friends home i shall ask tamson cory back to supper the girls left the house soon after and the colonel was left alone with his wife i'm so glad you didn't come to any open rupture 
remarked mrs trelawney with a sigh i'm afraid that'll not be the end of it though replied the colonel really i did not think things had gone so far end of chapter six